Good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you to our evening sermon tonight, and uh, thank you for joining us, whether you are part of our church and our regular attenders, or whether you are joining us from somewhere else in the world or somewhere else in the country. We want to extend a warm welcome to you. We are currently, as a church, going through the book of 1 Corinthians, and this evening we are up to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So if you would turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and we're going to read the first 13 verses. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 through to 13. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud, and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test the Lord, as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble, as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. These things have happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. This is God's word. Won't you join with me as we pray together and ask for God's help in understanding his word. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the privilege of being able to gather together even though we are part, even though we are behind TV screens. We thank you that through the technology you have given us, we are able to still hear from you. And we pray this evening that as we seek to discover what you have to say to us, how your word continues to be relevant to us today, that you would give us eyes to see, hearts that are open, minds that are willing to embrace what it is that you are saying to us, that you would point us to the Lord Jesus Christ as always. And we pray in some sense, some way, you will change us for your glory. And we pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. During the battle of the wilderness in the Civil War Union in America, the Union General John Sedgwick was inspecting his troops. At one point, he came to a parapet over which he gazed out in the direction of the enemy. His officers suggested that this was unwise and perhaps he ought to duck while passing the parapet. Nonsense, snapped the general. They couldn't hit an elephant at this distance. A moment later, Cedric fell to the ground, fatally wounded. Presumption is a very, very dangerous thing. And particularly for the Christian, it is dangerous for us to make 
presumptions about our spiritual walk. It's very easy for us to become complacent. It's very easy for us to think that we come under the blanket protection of God and we're okay and we're safe and we can uh, use our spiritual liberties in ways that are not helpful. And the Apostle Paul has been trying to bring to the surface this issue of our spiritual freedoms and how those freedoms ought not to cause us to make others stumble or to cause some damage to them. And we, the spiritual freedoms that God has given us ought not to be abused. Now this theme is going to continue on in this chapter and will continue on next week and the following week when Paul finally wraps it up. Last week, we saw how Paul does not use the freedoms and the privileges and the rights that God has given him. And he also makes the point that we must be careful that we don't miss out on the kingdom of God. And he continues that theme in this particular chapter and in these verses that we will consider this evening. There is a danger of becoming presumptuous about our spiritual freedom. There is a danger of abusing our spiritual freedom. There is a danger of taking our spiritual liberties and allowing those liberties to cause us to become complacent and think that because we have freedom now in Christ and because we are now under his protection and because we are in Christ, we can do whatever we please and God is simply going to allow us to to do those things, and our salvation is secure. And so what Paul does very cleverly is he raises the issue of what happens in the Old Testament. And in doing so, what he does is he connects the Old Testament people with the New Testament people. It is a reminder that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is the true Israel. It comprises of Old Testament saints and it also comprises of New Testament saints. There is this dialogue between the old and the new. And as Paul points out in Romans, all those who are truly descendant of Abraham in a spiritual sense belong in the vine of the Lord Jesus Christ and are God's children. And thus God's church, God's children, uh, God's family is made up of those people in the Old Testament who are truly in Christ and those in the New Testament who are in Christ. And he then takes us to the Old Testament to show us how there was a whole group of people who were following Moses under the leadership of Moses, under therefore the leadership of God, who because of the way in which they behaved, missed out on the inheritance. And Paul says to us, look, th this is given to us so that you and I don't make the same mistakes that we don't end up losing out on our inheritance. And remember, the inheritance he is speaking about is the inheritance of heaven. It is the prize that was spoken about previously. That if we are going to enjoy the prize of finally going to heaven, we must ensure that the way in which we live is reflective of what we have become as a result of the transformative process of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, there is this problem, I think, particularly today. I, I'm not uh, sure in different parts of history whether it was as prevalent as it is today, but it certainly is prevalent today where we think that the spiritual freedoms and liberties that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. After all, I've heard it said to me so often, we are under grace. And that, of course, is true. We are under grace. We are not under the law anymore. And it's absolutely right. But the problem is that because we consider ourselves no longer under the law, we become anti-law. Antinomianism is the word. And we seek to live in a way that says, I don't have to worry about ever having to obey uh, these precepts that were previously under the law. I, I'm under grace now. I can just live any way I want, and I'm okay. And Paul says to the Corinthians, you are mistaken. Don't think that you can engage in pagan practices 
consistently and think that somehow because you are also going to a church service and you are also engaging in the things of the church that you are safe. Oh no, says Paul. This example of the Israelites who showed that they missed out on the inheritance is given so that you and I can learn from it and realize that we can put ourselves in the same position of peril as those people did way back then. So come with me as we look at what the Apostle Paul says to us. Number one, I want you to notice the benefits of spiritual liberty. The benefits of spiritual liberty. Look at verses 1 through to 5. Let me read those verses again. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud. I'll explain all of this, so just hang in there. And that they passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses, into the cloud, and, into the, and in the sea. Now, that doesn't mean they went through physical baptism. This is simply a way in which Paul is saying that the Israelites came out of Egypt. God rescued them. The cloud was what guided them. The pillar of fire at night uh, guided them. And as a result of coming under the leadership of God, that's what he means when they were baptized, and under the leadership of Moses, they experienced this spiritual benefits of such leadership. He goes on. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They ate from the same spiritual food and, drink the, and, and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied him, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. So what the Apostle Paul is trying to say is that the Israelites enjoyed all kinds of spiritual privileges and benefits as a result of being delivered by God out of Egypt and coming under the leadership of Moses and the leadership of God ultimately. Now, when he talks about spirit, uh, drinking from the rock that was Christ, what he's trying to say there is that even though when they came to the rock which gushed out water in their wilderness wanderings and God provided from them, what you must see and what stands behind all of this imagery is the source of all of that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's saying something very, very important, and I'm sure you haven't missed it. It's reminding us that while the Israelites were in their wanderings in the desert for those 40 years, that Jesus Christ, even back then, though they may not have realized it, though they may not have understood it the way that we do because we are this side of the cross, they were the other side before the cross, Christ was with them in their spiritual uh, wanderings in the wilderness. Christ was feeding them spiritually in the wilderness. They were drinking from the true rock, and that true rock is the Lord Jesus Christ. So in the same way that you and I benefit spiritually from the relationship we have with the Lord Jesus Christ, they were benefiting from the same spiritual food that you and I benefit from way back then when they were wandering in the desert. It's a remarkable thing, isn't it? Because when we think about the Israelites and we think about their wilderness wanderings, we don't think that much about the fact that Christ was with them and their spiritual nourishment was coming from the true source and that true source is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what we see is Paul is trying to say to them, they were being sustained by Christ. And having been sustained by Christ, they took those spiritual realities and they turned them into something they ought not to turn them into. And thus God was displeased with their disobedience. And they thought that since we are receiving spiritual manna, since we are receiving food, we are safe, we are okay, we are under the protection of God. After all, did God not deliver them through bringing 
plagues upon Egypt? Did God not part the Red Sea? Did not God cause the uh, Egyptian army to perish in that sea? Did not God provide them with food when they were without food? Did not God provide them with meat when they didn't have meat? Did not God provide them with water when they were thirsty? Now, all of these things they considered as part of God's blessing as a result of their deliverance out of Egypt. And so they took for granted their protection. They thought, well, we're under the blanket cover of God, and therefore we are safe, and therefore we can do whatever we want, and we're okay. And they discovered, in fact, nothing could be further from the truth, for most of them lost out of their inheritance. They had a false sense of security. They thought their inheritance was guaranteed by God. They thought that they could disobey God, walk away from God, do whatever they wanted, and yet they would still land in their inheritance. And they discovered the opposite was true. Now the same danger faces this Corinthian church. They've come under Christ. They have established a church. They are attending the church. But simultaneously with attending the church, they are indulging in certain revelry, in certain pagan practices, and they are bringing themselves under those idols that are associated with those pagan practices. And Paul wants to warn them. Paul wants to say to them, don't think that because you sit in church on a Sunday morning or a Sunday evening and you participate in communion, that somehow you are safe and you are going to receive your inheritance. No, he says to them, your life is not just comprised with what happens on a Sunday morning or evening, but it is important as to what happens outside of those times. What's going on when you are at work, what's going on when you have free time? How are you conducting yourself then? And those things are important because at the end of the day, whether we like it or not, it's an indication of the true nature of who we are and what we believe. And so the Corinthians must not presume that because of the spiritual freedom they are exercising that their heavenly place is now guaranteed and they can live any way they like because they now have Christ and they've claimed Christ as their own and, and they're okay, they're safe. They push their freedom to the very edge. They flaunted their freedom. Is that not the danger that sometimes you and I face? I remember speaking to a young Christian man one day who was dating uh, a girl. And he, one day when we were having a, a conversation, he said to me, Ian, uh, I want to show you something. And he took out his wallet. And out of his wallet, he took out a condom. And he said to me, Ian, I've got this just in case I slip up. Here was a man who had, in a sense, almost planned to slip up by ensuring that he had a inverted commas, get out of jail free card in case he pushed the sexual boundaries beyond what was right in the sight of God. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. And these are the things that God wants us to avoid to protect ourselves against, that we not push our spiritual liberties too far. We all enjoy spiritual benefits, do we not? We may quite happily point to the blessings that God has poured out upon our lives and use these as a guide to being secure in our salvation. Look how God is blessing me. Like the Corinthian Christians, we may confidently exercise our freedoms and enjoy all of God's blessings to us, but not realize the dangerous position we are placing ourselves in because we are exposing ourselves to activities that are not Christ-like. We may also think it doesn't really matter because God has blessed us so we're safe. Maybe it's the places we go. Maybe it's the people we associate with. 
Maybe it's the fact that we think we are immune, that God's grace will just kick in. And we need to take greater care the way we conduct our lives. And we need to ask ourselves sometimes hard questions. How are we behaving? How are we conducting ourselves? What does our Christianity look like? Are we pushing ourselves to the very edge? Secondly, I want you to notice the abuses of spiritual liberty. The abuses of spiritual liberty. Paul deals with four abuses, four of them. Verses 6 through to 13. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things just as they did. In other words, what the Apostle Paul does right at the very beginning is he frames all of this as a problem of the heart. It is the heart that drives us to do the things that we do. And when our hearts are not fully submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, and when we are in control of our hearts, then it is from those hearts, from the innermost part. And when he talks about the heart, he's not talking about the heart that pumps out your blood, but he's talking about the innermost part of the being, the very center of the person. When that is not submitted to Christ, and when we are in the driving seat and not Jesus, then we will tend to do things consistently with the fact that we are steering the ship rather than Christ steering the ship. And so the Apostle Paul begins by saying we need to sort out our hearts. Don't allow the evil that sometimes comes within our hearts to be the driving force in our lives. What did it do here? Well, there were four problems. Number one, the problem of idolatry. Look at verse 7. The problem of idolatry. We're going to go through these very quickly. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. Now the problem here is that uh, they are going to these temples and they are indulging in the revelry associated in these temples. Now the problem with idolatry here, and Paul has dealt with this to some extent previously, so I don't want to cover ground that has already been covered, is that when they went to these cultic feasts, there were idols present at these feasts. And so it meant that you would come to these feasts and with the presence of these idols in the temple in which they were celebrating these cultic feasts, you were bringing yourself into submission to those idols by participating in those meals. And as a result of that, it meant that the, alongside bringing yourself into submission, there were certain revelry practices that they engaged in associated with those idols. And these Christians who were going to these cultic feasts, a, a remnant of the past, a carryover from what they used to do, would then participate in some of these revelries associated with these idols. And by participating in those things, they were bringing themselves under the submission of those idols. In other words, they were worshipping them. And Paul says, you can't do that. It's idolatry. And so he mentions the golden calf incident in Israel from Exodus chapter 32 verse 6 where the people, when Moses went up to the mountain, let me read the verse, Exodus 32, 6. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterwards they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. It's exactly the same problem. The idol they set up when Moses was up on the mountain receiving the commandments was a golden calf. And they began to worship that golden calf. And as a result, revelry ensued because that was associated with the calf. And the same thing has happened in the Corinthians. And Paul is saying, you, you can't go to church on a Sunday and go to a pagan, a pagan feast on a Saturday night or whenever they were going. And then somehow justify that. It just doesn't work. You can't mix and match. 
And so there is a danger, you see, for us to engage in idolatry. Now, idolatry for us may not be as obvious as that. And many times in the past, we have spoken about idolatry. Money can become an idol. Our homes can become an idol. We, we can worship celebrities. We can even allow ourselves to bow down to people that we hold in high esteem within our own community. We can sometimes worship our possessions. We can worship our families, worship in the sense of making and turning our children into idols, turning our marriage into idols. Idolatry is all over. And Paul is saying, be careful that you don't get so subtly sucked in thinking that you can indulge in idolatry at the same time as worshiping God. God will not and does not and never has tolerated idolatry. Second, the problem of immorality. Look at verse 8. The problem of immorality. Let me read the verses to you. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. Think about that for a moment. 23,000. I won't read the, the account. It's in Numbers chapter 25, verses 1 to 9. But here is this sexual immorality. Now, what happened at the temple, as you see, is that these people would go to the temple and for many of the temples, they would provide prostitutes. And so part of the cultic meal, part of the celebration of that meal, was that you would engage in sexual acts with these prostitutes were, that were supplied. Moreover, it wasn't only the prostitutes that were supplied, but there was sexuality amongst those who attended those particular cultic feasts. And so, if I can put it very bluntly, it was one big, great orgy. And this was going on in association with these feasts. And exactly the same thing had happened in Israel with the idolatry. And as a result of these people back in Israel engaging in sexual immorality amongst each other, God put 23,000 of them to death. And the point is clear. God will not and does not stand for subpar ethical morals when it comes to the Christian. We have a certain ethical standard that God has given us. There are certain morals that should be consistent in our lives. And we are not a, a, to allow ourselves to be tempted into acting in ways that are inconsistent with the ethics that God has given to us in His Word. The society we live in is an extremely sexual society. It is an extremely tolerant society sexually. Most non-believers, if not nearly all of them, will live together before they get married. In God's sight, that is ethically wrong. Many will engage in multiple sexual relationships before they get married. And it's the accepted norm. That's what you do. It's almost a badge of honor as to how many different sexual relationships you've engaged in. In God's economy, that is wrong. And it's very easy for us to get sucked in, to get told, what's the problem? It's just having a little bit of fun. It's just enjoying oneself. Let me give you a really good example of this that I came across. It's of an interview that was given on one of these talk shows a while ago. There was a girl who wanted to be married by her pastor. And then she posed in a pornographic magazine, Playboy. And he refused to marry her. So she wanted to go and she went on this particular TV show to tell the whole world what this pastor had done to her. She said, it's none of his business. It's my right if I want to. She used the word fornicate with my boyfriend for several years. And if I want to pose in play playboy, that's my right. Jesus would never condemn me for that, she said. 
Jesus loves me. I believe in Jesus. I'm a Christian. I believe in his death and resurrection. She went on to say that Jesus would never condemn me for that, and I don't think it's right for him to condemn me. Do you see the problem? You see, it's very easy to simply say, well, it's got nothing to do with him, and, and I'm free to act sexually the way that I want to. But once you begin to act in ways that are inconsistent with God's word, what Paul writes to these Corinthians and says, you become in danger of missing out on your inheritance, which is eternal life in heaven with God one day. Now, some might say, well, I, I thought it's impossible to lose your salvation. What well, is impossible to lose your salvation? But you see, the issue here is, those who are truly saved will resist those pressures consistently. And those who claim salvation but are not truly saved will allow themselves to be drawn aside by these things and indulge in them and like this young girl, boast about them to the whole world. They will have no shame about what they are doing, no sense of conviction, no sense of coming under the Lordship of Christ. And the reason for that is because they haven't really been saved. And so for a believer, for a true believer, there is a sense in which it is almost impossible to consistently engage in that kind of immorality and not ever come under the conviction of God by the Holy Spirit. It's impossible. You just can't. Because if God is living in you, and your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, which it is, which Paul is going to deal with, the reality is, since you are the temple of the Holy Spirit and God dwells in you, you cannot do things that are inconsistent with who you are in Christ without being convicted. It's impossible. It just can't happen. And so the Apostle Paul is saying to these Corinthians, don't think that God is going to turn a blind eye to your immorality. And Christian, can I say to you, God is not going to simply turn a blind eye if you are engaged in persistent immorality. Respond if you are engaged to the convicting power of God. Repent, turn away from that sin. For there is forgiveness in Christ. There is restoration in Christ. But you must turn away. You must renounce. You must repent. And you must turn to Christ and cry out for forgiveness. And there is forgiveness. Number three, the problem of presumption. Look at verse nine. The problem of presumption. We should not test the Lord as some of them did and were killed by snakes. Now, what on earth is he referring to there? Well, he's referring to the incident, let me read it, where, people, where God's people moaned about having no food or water. Numbers 21, verses 4 to 7. They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and Moses, and they said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? There's no bread. There's no water. And we detest this miserable food. Then Yahweh sent venomous snakes among them, and they bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against Yahweh and against you. Pray that Yahweh will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. What was the problem? Well, the problem was presumption. And the problem in verse 9 is that they no longer trusted God. They tested him. They demanded that God give them something. They presumed that God should just simply bow to their every woman fancy. If they wanted something and they made their demands to God, well, God must just provide for them. And then they moaned uh, and tested God by saying, you know, we victims, God. We, 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 you, you've brought us into the desert to torture us, to make life difficult for us. We want to go back to Egypt. In fact, it was in Egypt that they were truly victims. But now they're saying God has turned them into victims. God is the one that is causing all this pain and suffering. And so they're testing God. They, they, they're presuming that their plight is a result of, of God's action against them. And of course, it's not. 
And because they presume against God, they test his patience. They demand certain things from God. God, you must, you should. Why don't you? And thus they question his goodness, question his provision. They put the Lord God to the test. And we are told not to put the Lord God to the test. When Jesus was tempted, that's what Satan tried to do, to get him to put God to the test. And Jesus says you are not to put the Lord your God to the test. And these people were doing exactly that, testing God. Presuming, thinking that they deserve these things, that God must just bow down to them. And God will have none of it. And so he sends these snakes, and a whole lot of them are put to death as a result of that. Now the Corinthians were putting God to the test in this sense. They were presuming that they would still be protected by God, and uh, be kept safe by God in spite of the fact that they were engaging in sexual immorality and in revelry associated with these feasts and in idolatry. They just presumed, we're under grace. We're under God's protection. We're okay. We can do these things. We don't have to worry about it. we covered. And God turns to them and says, no, you're not. Don't think that somehow you can presume certain protections when you are behaving in a certain way that is inconsistent with what you claim to be in terms of your faith and your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they are warned by God. We too can test the Lord, can't we? By pushing our spiritual liberties to the edge, using our freedoms in such a way to justify the things we do. We may be quite happily saying we can engage in questionable activities because we're free. For example, you may say, you know, the Bible doesn't say anything about gambling. It doesn't say I can't gamble. So, so uh, there's no problem in me going and buying a ticket for the, for the, uh, at, at a shop and hope that somehow my number will come up when those balls come up and, or go to a, a pokies machine and put some money in and, and pull the handle to take part in the lottery. There's no hassle. The Bible doesn't say I can't do that. And so we push our limits and we don't trust God because who is the one that ultimately provides for us? A gambling machine? A lottery ticket? Or God? Who do we trust to provide for us? And it's very easy in the areas of freedom where Scripture maybe doesn't say something directly for us then to push the boundaries as far to the edge as we can. rather than bring ourselves under the Lordship of Christ. Fourthly, there's the problem of grumbling. Look at verse 10. Verse 10. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. What incident is that? That's Numbers chapter 14, verses 1 to 38. For the sake of time, I won't re, uh, reread the story. But that was the situation, if you remember, where they were unwilling to invade Canaan. And remember the 12 spies go out to the land, they come back, 10 spies say they're giants, it's too hard, we can't invade. Two of the spies come back uh, and they say, yes, we can invade, we, 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 with God's help we will, we will uh, conquer them. And the majority of the Israelites go with the other 10 and say, oh no, you've brought us up in the desert just for us to die. And, and, and God begins to act in judgment against them. Grumbling, grumbling. And throughout the desert wanderings, there is repeated grumbling against God. And the problem here is that some in Corinth were grumbling against Paul. Paul had written them previously about this in chapter 5, verses 9 to 11. And they were grumbling. They didn't like what Paul had to say. They were grumbling about these so-called restrictions that they had to operate within. They weren't happy about it. They didn't think it was fair. 
They thought that they, they should be free to do what they wanted to do. And, and how dare someone else tell them what they should or shouldn't do. Oh, is that not so true today? We're happy Christians as long as we're never rebuked. As long as we can do whatever we do in the freedom of doing it without anyone ever pulling us up and saying to us, you know, perhaps what you're doing and what you're engaging in is not Christian. And then we get offended and then we get angry. And then we turn to them and say, judge not lest you be judged. The most quoted verse in the world today. And we grumble about them and we start saying, oh, but, but look at your life. You, you're doing X, Y, and Z and, and how dare you come and speak to me about this. And so we take the focus of ourselves and we put it onto others. It's very easy to do that. Sometimes it hurts when others point out the things that are not right in our lives. And sometimes we need to remember that we need to trust their assessment Sometimes we grumble about even more mundane things. We grumble because God hasn't given us enough. We grumble because someone else is more gifted than us. Someone else is more prominent than us. Someone else is better off than us. We grumble because we're not happy with the way that God has made us. We grumble because our physical appearance is not what we would like it to be. We grumble because we don't have the intellectual capacity of some. We grumble because our house, uh, we'll never be able to buy a house as big as someone else we know. We grumble because we don't have enough money to buy the things that we would like. And then sometimes we sit down to eat our food, we say grace, and we grumble because we don't like what we're eating. At the end of the day, my dear friends, grumbling against God is a slap to his face. It's saying to God, I don't like the fact of where you've placed me or what you've made me and the things that you have given me or haven't given me. I don't think you're being fair to me. We bring God's justice into question. We bring God's character into question. We bring God's purposes into question. We bring God's design for us into question. And in effect, what we say to God is we know better because we think we should have had these things and we deserve them. And we forget what the Apostle Paul says, give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. What are you grumbling about? Are you grumbling about your lot in life? Are you grumbling about the fact that you haven't found that partner yet to get married? And it seems unfair that God has allowed you to remain single. Are you grumbling because God took your husband or wife prematurely? Are you grumbling because your kids are disobedient? Are you grumbling because your bank balance is not what you would like it to be? Are you grumbling because you think you should be in a better job and the job you're in doesn't pay you enough and you don't get enough recognition and, and, and you, know, you, you should be getting promoted and you're not? Are you grumbling about your employment situation? What are you grumbling about? Leave those things at the foot of the cross and give thanks to God for all that you have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then thirdly, very quickly, the antidote to spiritual liberty. Look at verses 11 to 13. What's the antidote to all of this, these dangers? Look at verses 11 to 13. These things happened to them as examples that were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. Now that fulfillment of the ages, what he means by that is that we are living in two ages. This age we are living in currently is an old age. It is passing away. It is on its way out. The new age has dawned. God's kingdom has dawned in this world. And that kingdom is seen as it is expressed wherever there are Christians. God's kingdom is experienced where Christians are. 
That is the kingdom of God. And we will see that somewhat in the book of Matthew. So that age has come and will ultimately be the new age that we as Christians will enjoy forever with God, right? So let's keep going. Um, so if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. So there he's saying to us, remember, don't think, don't become so overconfident that you're strong enough to resist every temptation that comes your way. Don't think that you can put yourself in the place of temptation and somehow you, above all else, are able to resist. Be careful that you don't allow your own pride and your own strength and your own resources to cause you to yield to temptation. Oh, it's such a danger, isn't it? Sometimes we flirt with danger. Sometimes we think, you know, I'm not going to fall like that. I mean, I, I'm, I'm never going to cheat on my wife. So if after work I go around or at lunchtime have a meal or a coffee with a, another woman at work, I, I'm, I'm not going to stray or vice versa, if you're a woman and married to your husband, thinking, well, if I have lunch with this guy in the office, you know, there's nothing in it. We're just platonic friends, and I'm strong enough, and even if he were to do something, I'm able to resist. Don't put yourself in that position, says Paul. Don't think you're too strong to fall. And if your problem, for example, is pornography, then you need to get someone who can put something on your computer that will prevent you from accessing those sites that is password protected, so you can't go there. And then don't try and discover or, or put yourself in a position of going to a different computer and, and exposing yourself to the danger of falling in that area. Paul says, be careful. Don't think you, you're too strong. Don't think you're above temptation. It's very easy for us to think that will never happen to me. That only happens to others. Everyone, given the right circumstances, the right people involved, the right conditions, is capable of every possible sin. It is only the grace of God that prevents us from walking down those paths. Now, does he not say that? Listen to what he says. Verse 13, listen to what God says. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand under. There's a whole sermon in that verse, and we don't have time, unfortunately, to really unpack it and expound it. But there are a couple of things he says there. Number one, no temptation has seized you that is unique. You will never, ever face a temptation in this world that is completely novel, that is completely new, that is completely unique. You will never face something that has never, ever been faced before. All temptation has already been faced. And Jesus has faced it all. And that's what we see in his uh, temptations that he faces uh, in Matthew chapter 4. We see that uh, in his life, Jesus understands temptation. And so the writer of the Hebrews, if you were listening yesterday, uh, sorry, a week ago in the morning service, verse 15 of chapter 4, says uh, Jesus as our great high priest um, who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, and yet was without sin. So Jesus understands the temptations. So there is no novel temptation. You're not going to get tested in a way that is different to anyone else. Second thing he says about temptation is that God will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. So in other words, God's not going to allow you to face a temptation that is going to stretch you and stretch you and stretch you until finally, boom, you snap. God won't do it. Whatever temptations come your way, God will ensure there is no temptation too strong that you cannot resist with his grace. It's always with his grace. So there's no sense in which the Christian can ever turn around and say, but, but, but I, I just couldn't resist because this temptation was just too powerful and it just overwhelmed me and I just found myself sinking and I thought, there's no way I can resist. No, 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 no. God says he will not allow you to be exposed to that kind of temptation. Now, every person is different. Uh, we don't all respond in the same way. And so our strengths and weaknesses are different. And so the, the kinds of temptations that are going to 
be more of a problem for me are going to be different to the ones that are going to be more of a problem for you because we're different. But whatever my problems are and whatever my weaknesses are and whatever your weaknesses are, God will ensure that He will never allow you to face something that cannot be resisted. Doesn't that give you great courage and encouragement? And then notice what he says, finally. He will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. I wish we could spend more time there. Now, what I want you to notice here, when it says he will provide a way out, God is not saying he'll take it away. What God is saying is that there is always an escape route. Always, always. And so when that temptation comes to you, and when it seems so powerful and overwhelming, God is able to provide an escape plan so that you can get out of there and not have to yield. You see, what Paul is saying to these Corinthians, yes, I know those temptations are great. I know you want to indulge in in, in these cultic meals. I know you want to go to these, these places. I know that the sexual immorality is a powerful urge. God has created us as sexual beings. I know, I know all of that's true. But for all that temptation, God has provided a way out. So, my dear friend. What is your weakness? What is the area in your life where temptation seems so very difficult to resist? Where do you find yourself so often stumbling, so often yielding? What is the repetitive sin for you? Is it pornography? Is it anger? Is it envy? Is it selfishness? Is it greed? Is it lust? Is it dissatisfaction with your lot? Is it money? Is it how you use your leisure time? I don't know. But you know. And God knows. And when those temptations come, remember, God will strengthen you to enable you to find a way out so that you don't have to yield. You can't do it on your own strength. You can't do it on your own resources. And if you try, you'll fail again and again and again. But if you draw on the grace of God, you draw on the strength, that mighty power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, you will resist. Come, let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this text that reminds us of not taking for granted the spiritual liberty we have in Christ, not allowing ourselves to be led astray, not allowing ourselves to abuse the spiritual freedom we have. I pray for those who are struggling in this area, who have turned your grace into license. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would Bring them back to the cross. Bring them back to the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn them around to help them to walk in a different direction with your help, with your strength. And when those temptations come hard and fast as they do every day, I provide you would make, I pray that you would make clear to them the way out that you have provided for them and that you would remind them that they don't have to yield and that whatever it is they're facing is not too strong to overpower them. Do this for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Enjoy the rest of your week. God bless you.